I saw Le Grand Bain. Yeah, it's really funny. <laughs> it's really funny. Well, the noir classic. Sam, did you kill him? Not my personal favorite, but like, you know, obviously um, one of the classics. Let's see. The Big Sleep, I prefer because the dialogue is so great. Where did you find her? I didn't find her. Well, then how I did you... I haven't been here. You haven't seen me, and she hasn't been out of this house all evening. Not really the most visually stylistic uh, of the American noir films, but the dialogue is just fantastic. Well, see... Nobody thinks of Citizen Kane as a noir film, but um, I actually think uh, it's like the origin of really expressionistic style with like light and shadow and all the amazing shots by Greg Toland. The thing about Citizen Kane is like it's it's sort of the original American auteur film in the sense that he was that he was 25 when he made this film, you know, and wrote it and acted in it and directed it. Is that really your idea of how to run a newspaper? I don't know how to run a newspaper, Mr. Thatcher. I just try everything I can think of. To me, this is the root of all like American auteur filmmaking. Yeah, that one. Um, it's like a great B movie, you know. I think it's um, it doesn't have a political dimension or like a a commentary on like American national character or anything like that, but it has the best opening shot. I mean, I think this is like the beginning of almost like the tradition of doing the long unbroken shot. It's like from this to Birdman, um, there's some line of connection. Fuck it, we'll make a comeback. They're waiting for something huge. This is Le Doulos. That's like one of my favorite French noir films. L'entretien que t'as eu avec Jean à propos de la mort d'Arlette. In some ways, I, I like Belmondo even more than Bogart. I think he's cooler. Like, I think Bogart, Bogart's really funny, but he's a little bit stylized, you know. You can make satire out of Bogart more than Belmondo. He's just, like, incredibly cool. And I love the ending. Of, this has the great, best ending when he gets, um, he's going to go to meet the girl, and then the villain rises up one last time and shoots him in the back. And he, he goes to the phone and calls her and says, I can't make it, and, like, puts it down and fixes his hair and then dies. <laughs> This is a, you know, this, for my money, like Jacques Audiard, Un Parfait, uh, Rust and Bone, The Beat My Heart Skip, those three films in a row, I think that was like one of the most masterful series of three films anybody in the modern age has made. I think The Godfather and Goodfellas and Un Parfait are the three best gangster films ever. Delicious. Just go on. This was my first film, my first film I directed. Oh, can I just say, I immense your oi. Very different in tone from Motherless Brooklyn. Boys. Frank, frankly, frankly, Franco. But also a great New York film. The beginning of one of the greatest uh, filmmaking catalogs in modern history. Now, see, obviously, Manhattan, not noir, but to me, this one is uh, this one is is really inspiring in terms of just the composition, shooting New York. Really, so pretty when the light starts to come up. Oh, I know, I love it. You can always tell when p the difference in a film if the director really lives in New York versus like they live in L.A. and they come into New York and make a movie. Like this has a visual understanding of New York that. Um, is just tremendous and also one of the great cinematographers of all time, Gordon Willis. I think this is one of the best visually composed New York films ever made. You worked with Woody Allen, right? Yeah. On this one. Yeah. Everyone says I love you. My baby's not much for sports. Like running around tennis court. We, uh, which uh, we shot a little of here in Paris. There was a big... Um, how do you say the strike? La Greve? There was a, yeah, there was a horrible strike going on. So none of our trucks... Our trucks couldn't move to the sets anywhere, so we had to walk. This was one that inspired me a lot. I mean, after Citizen Kane and Orson Welles, I would say the next most significant actor who turned into an auteur filmmaker was Warren Beatty. Everybody told him that nobody in the world wants to see a three-hour movie about American socialists, and your career is going to end with this movie. And he said, screw it, you know, I want to make it anyway. And um, I think it's I think it's like one of the masterpieces of films about American history, about, uh, it's just, it's just, it's like one of the great films made by an actor, director ever. It's just a good reminder. Sometimes you just got to give people the middle finger and do what you want to do. Um, so like to me, there's a straight line from Citizen Kane to that one. 
to this one. What are you trying to do? What am I trying to do? What are you trying to do? Man, I want some brothers up on the wall. Man, I gotta work here, man. You fucking my shit up. This was like one of the most important films of my young adult life. This was such, Phil Hoffman and I, when we were making um, the 25th hour with Spike. Damn, you all right? Trying not to think about it, you know? We talked about how, what an impact this had on all of us. You know, he was 27, maybe. He wrote, directed, starred in produced a movie about his own neighborhood. It was like the most fantastic music. It was entertaining, but it was like the most serious, challenging conversation about race and the morality of American life. I mean, it's, there's really like, this is, this is in the top, top, top films of the last 30 years in my book. Terrible DVD cover. I like, I look at it, why it makes it, it looks like my eyes are crossed. It was like, the poster was so good, it was like that. And then they make this DVD cover that looks like like somebody is, um, I don't even know, I can't stand it. This was, uh, this, this one had a big impact on me because it, it, um, there hadn't been like a real proper noir kind of atmospheric to serious film in a while. White, I'm glad you're here. I need you to see this. I think some people thought like those movies were over or they were outdated or whatever and I just remember thinking like the photography the seriousness of the actors the music the dialogue it was just that kind of hypnosis that makes a period film really work well this is interesting yeah I mean the anthology Unforgiven like another you know great one by a uh, director producer actor I think about him now and again you wouldn't tif typically put Unforgiven on a noir list, obviously, because it's not a detective movie. But it is kind of, um, if there was ever a Western that's a noir Western, I think it's un Unforgiven because noir to me is, it's not just about detective movies. It's like about the idea of saying, well, there's the popular American narrative, but underneath there's a shadow narrative. There's something darker. There's something that's not as nice as we say it is. And what I loved about that was it was like Clint Eastwood, the ultimate Western star, kind of saying, hey, the West wasn't full of cowboy heroes. It was full of murderers who killed people while they're sitting in the toilet, and it's all ugly. That's right. I've killed women and children. Barton Fink is fun. These guys, um, this one funny thing about Barton Fink is uh, it has that great moment where he can't, he hasn't delivered the script, and uh, the producer says, um, what's taking you so long, Fink? It's a wrestling picture. It's not Ruggles of Red Gap. What the hell do you think this is, Hamlet? Going with the... Wind Ruggles a red, it's a goddamn B picture. I remember we watched that and I remember thinking like, the Coens never say anything without meaning something. And I was like, what is Ruggles of Red Gap? Like, why are they saying, you know, it's a wrestling picture, not Ruggles of Red Gap. I went and found Ruggles of Red Gap, which is like probably one of the 10 best American comedies ever. It's, it's, uh, it's a real hidden gem. A lot of people don't know about. And I'm more than disappointed because I thought that Egbert had, uh, had something in him. There's something in him, yes, madam. Clute is a good modern noir. My name is John Clute. You said that. Clute is really one of the very, very best modern noir films, I think, um, with Jane Fonda and Donald Sutherland. That's that's a really, really dark movie. Well, this is this is a good one. Taxi Driver, in the films that I've watched like the most times, this would be up there. I, I, I think I've probably seen this film 50 times. Like, I really, I used to watch this film so much. It's not noir per se, but it kind of is in the way that it's photographed and the way the way it photographs New York and the way um, the music works, the sultry kind of sensuality of the jazz and the brooding sort of sense of danger in it. My first film that I did, Primal Fear. There was someone else in that room, Mr. Vale. The cinematographer Michael Chapman shot it and he shot Taxi Driver and Raging Bull and a lot of other great ones. And I, I think he was, he started to get annoyed with how many questions I was asking him. He was like, who is this, who is this kid, this 25-year-old kid, who's bugging me about like, uh, you know, the, the variable speed dial that they created on um, Raging Bull. But he actually said he was more proud of this than Raging Bull, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> Raging Bull is sort of like Fight Club in the sense that people forget like by 1990 it was on every 
list of the best films, but when it actually came out in 1980, people weren't so kind to it. A lot of critics, when you look back at it, they were really, really critical of it. And De Niro got nominated. I guess he won for that, but it wasn't actually fully appreciated in the moment that it was put out. And certainly the same was true of Fight Club. It was, it was like a total flop at the box office. Gentlemen, welcome to Fight Club. It made people too uncomfortable. And I think uh, things like, like um, Raging Bull and Fight Club, it kind of reminds you like, Sometimes you just gotta let something be and people will come to it and make their own judgment over time, which is sort of more satisfying in the end. In an interesting way, American History X was, um, it was appreciated much more in France when it first came out than it was in the States. My father gave me that truck, you motherfucker! You ever shoot at violence? It was appreciated somewhat, but I actually think, I think people here got it quicker. And then again, it had kind of a long tail. Sin City, this is not my favorite Bruce Willis movie. You got a great attitude, Bob. Pulp Fiction, I think, probably is the best one. Bruce got our movie made. He saw me in a play and he came up to me and he was like, I, you know, whatever you're doing, he's like, I want to do something with you. If you have something, call me and we'll do it. And I, I didn't think he would remember that. And then when we went to do Motherless Brooklyn, I, I told him, I called him, I said, look, it's, it's, it's only in the first, you know, 25 pages. And he was like, that's cool. I love it, let's make it. And so he was a big part of the reason the film got made. Brooklyn's just in trouble now. Ooh. And the whole cast, Alec Baldwin, Willem Dafoe, Bobby Cannavale, helped me get it made. It was pretty incredible. I like the Samurai. That's, that's, I think that's the best Melville. Really great. Like that's definitely one of the top two or three, I think. French noir films. He's really great. So one one for Belmondo, one for <laughs> Delon. Mm, Truffaut never really. I mean, is Thierry sur le pianiste? Is that Truffaut? Yeah. Monsieur Sarroyant. Yeah, that's that's got like you know, so that's got some cool style. Truffaut never acted in any of his own films, though, did he? He did. Yeah. What did he act in? Ah. I forgot that. No? So he did. Wow. So, okay. So he had one. He did it all. The best thing he's in is uh, Close Encounters. I beg your pardon, but my English is not good too. His role in Close Encounters is so great. Yeah, the way he appears out of the, the, the wind and the sand. In, with, you know, oh, it's so good. That is, I think, Spielberg's best film. I like this, this guy's films have been great. This actually reminded me of um, one of my favorite filmmakers who I got to work with, Milos Forman. This Cold War reminded me a lot of Loves of a Blonde. Just, this was, this was wonderful, really heartbreaking. This is a great film. Squeeze it. If this had to be my last film, I would be pretty proud of it too. <laughs> Jonah Hill, pal of mine, really nice first film. did such a great job it's like this kind of it's not like 400 blows but it did remind me of like that kind of a film about youth yeah about about kids and their energy um did you ever see a little film called uh raising victor vargas do you see the wall of isolation you get annoying oh, talk, talk about really good new york films that's like 400 blows it's it's really really great about a these kids growing up poor on the Lower East Side. Oh, it's really, really good. I've been wanting to see um, Parasite, but I haven't seen Parasite yet. <laughs> Heard that's really nice. I saw Le Grand Bain. It's on my. Yeah, it's really funny. <laughs> it's really funny. It's like the French Full Monty or something. <laughs> I, it's, that was really, really funny. You have to pick just one DVD, one film. What would you choose? Mm, for one night? Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen Harold and Maude in a while. Maybe I would watch Harold and Maude. They grow and bloom and fade and die and change into something else. That's a pretty good one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, that's my tour of noir video. <laughs>